The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Adapting to Innovation in Pediatric ALL, Guidance on Optimizing Modern Therapy and the Role of Novel Asparaginase Compounds. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash KQX860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Well, good, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, today's session, which is entitled Adapting to Innovation in Pediatric Acute Lymphoblastic Leukemia, Guidance on Optimizing Modern Therapy and the Role of Novel Asparaginase Compounds. Uh, Dr. Shore and I are really excited to be here today. <clears throat> so I'm going to just start with the asparaginase story. And as uh, maybe some of the people in the audience know, asparaginine is an amino acid that was first isolated in asparagus, and so that's where it gets its name. Interesting phenomenon is that developing lymphoid cells are entirely dependent on serum or CSF concentrations of asparagine. They can't make asparagine themselves. And so asparagine is a necessary ingredient for the synthesis of nucleic acids in cell division. And if this unusual uh, situation did not exist about asparagine and lymphocytes, we wouldn't be having this talk today. That's how fundamental that, that odd finding is. Asparaginase itself deaminates the amino acid group circled in red, and that's the asparagine um, amino acid. I should also mention that um, asparaginine uh, deaminates uh, glut glutamine as well in the same phenomenon. So uh, let's go back in time to uh, 1961 when a, a group of investigators looked at the effects of asparaginase in an anti-lymphoma model and found that they could um, interfere with cell division and they could get serum levels of asparaginase in uh, the animals that they were testing. This then led to uh, a case report where a group of investigators uh, uh, gave asparaginase to a patient in 1966 who had a response, and white count went from 18,000 to 4,000. The lymphoblast decreased uh, down to 14%. The patient's liver uh, decreased in size, and his uh, testicular enlargement also decreased in size. And you can see that, uh, 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 that uh, these uh, values are shown in the figure to the right. So um, what this goes to show is that asparaginase is a cornerstone for ALL treatment, but because it's a protein, it's discontinued in up to 25 patients because of toxicity, which includes a number of things we'll talk about later. Uh, asparaginase was pegylated to make it less obvious to the uh, immune system, and so it's been used in first-line formulation for, uh, you know, for a long time in high-income countries. And uh, recently, Erwinia uh, chrysanthemi was approved for uh, use in 2011 as an alternative to patients that have hypersensitivity to pegasparagase. Uh, what's important to me about that is that I was running the 0434 TALL study from 2007 to 2014, and it was a great relief to the study committee that we had an alternate form uh, to, to give of asparaginase to give to patients that had problems with it. And so all of this was recently summarized in a paper that uh, talked about asparaginase over the last 50 years. Um, I just wanted to point out that there are some new types of asparaginase that we're working with, and uh, the one that we're going to be talking about uh, throughout this conversation is pegasparagase. Uh, all the other asparaginase across the top of the slide, including Erwinia, and now a recombinant Erwinia that was approved in 2021 to be given as 25 milligrams per meter squared IM every uh, 48 hours. And so that's the latest one to, to join the team. What this slide is showing is that intensive asparaginase treatment improves clinical outcomes. And if you'll notice in the slide, the gray bar shows uh, treatments that were used 
using more intensive asparaginase, and the blue bars, um, less intensive asparaginase. And you can see by the numbers embedded in the bars uh, what the outcomes were like in terms of percentage of uh, EFS. And basically, the, the message across the slide is that um, more asparaginase generally worked better than less asparaginase. So um, more is better than less. Uh, but here's an in this is a really important study that came out in uh, the year 2020 by Gupta et al. And it basically reports outcomes in patients and where the asparaginase couldn't be given for some reason. And you can see by the red dotted bar that where there was discontinuation of asparaginase, there was um, a decrease in event-free survival, which uh, turns out to be a really important finding to the asparaginase story. And I have to say, as a treating clinician, when I had patients that I could no longer give asparaginase to, I thought, well, you know, the, they're getting dose-intensified therapy. Maybe it doesn't matter that much, but this paper shows that clearly it does matter and that it's a really important drug um, in our repertoire of chemotherapy. So what are the challenges that affect asparaginase delivery today? Um, they fall into two main categories, drug shortages and unique toxicities. During the pandemic, we all became very aware of pipeline issues or supply chain issues, and that also affected the asparaginase uh, story. There are unique toxicities related to the asparaginases, and there are also unique physiologies that we're working with here. Uh, children handle asparaginase differently than older adults. Many of our, our colleagues that are medical oncologists find that they really can't give asparaginase to people who are in their fourth or fifth decade just because of some of the toxicities that are associated with these drugs. So getting back to shortages, uh, um, here is the website for FDA drug shortages. And you can see here that uh, Ir Irwinia was on that list uh, based on this data. And, uh, and then in terms of toxicities, uh, here's sort of a, a basic breakdown of what we're looking at. Hypersensitivities are probably the most common, followed by uh, pancreatitis, hyperglycemia, hepatotoxicity, and thrombosis. So that's kind of the, the list of things that we kind of have to work through as we try to uh, uh, maintain dose intensity with this class of drugs. So uh, in today's agenda, we're going to have an introduction and in where we stand with asparaginase therapy and ALL. And then we're going to have a, a case discussion where we're going to follow a patient through uh, several scenarios and uh, talk about uh, treatment options and tre treatment barriers. So uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Reuven Shore, who will then uh, take over the presentation and walk us through uh, the first aspects of our case history. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it really is very good to be here in person after so long away. Start with a clinical consult of the patient, um, Michael, with T-cell ALL, um, an, an obese African-American teenager who um, begins a four-drug induction um, based on the ALL-1231 protocol. So if just a question to ponder as we go on is, you know, what, what risk factors does Michael have for asparagine-related toxicity? And the uh, second question is, should dose capping be considered for this patient? So um, one of the things that we've learned, uh, as Stuart pointed out, more asparaginase is better for outcomes, but too much asparaginase can cause problems. And um, the adult oncology community has been very focused on dose capping asparaginase um, when given, and often caps at one vial size, which is 3,750 international units. And the question uh, in, the, in the pediatric community, as we have more and more patients with high body surface area and obesity, should we think about whether some of these patients would benefit from dose capping without affecting efficacy? Um, so th this paper looked at the, out the um, effects in terms of toxicity based on BMI of patients. And if you can see that um, 
BMI diagnosis that's greater than the 95th percentile was the, was the only finding that they found significant for, um, for increased toxicity. And this particular toxicity is looking at conjugated hyperbilirubinia. Um, this here looks uh, in both ob obese and non-obese. Um, both obese older patients greater than 10 had the highest risk of severe hepatotoxicity and of clinical pancreatitis, followed by uh, older children and then obese younger children. So particularly in those ob obese teenage patients, we need to think hard about what we can do to minimize their toxicity. Um, this is a pediatric paper focused on patients who received uh, doses under that dose cap that's often used in adult, by adult oncologists of 3750 international units co as compared to those um, above that dose cap. And we see that the incidence of uh, thromboemboli, um, pancreatitis, and hyperglycemia are all increased for patients that received higher doses. Uh, one thing to note about this paper is this did not, this, this may be a surrogate that's really looking at um, elevated BSA and obesity because this did not look at patients of the same BSA that were dose-capped or that were not dose-capped. That being said, um, we, we do have evidence to suggest that patients even that receive dose-capped still, uh, still receive enough asparaginase to be highly efficacious. Um, Children's Oncology Group recently included um, dosing modifications for patients that are uh, both older than 21 years of age and for patients that are obese, the standard dose that we've been using for quite a while is 2,500 international units per meter square per dose. Um, a new, new, newly approved dosing for adults uh, through the FDA was for 2,000 international units per meter square per dose. And then just being sure to consider for patients who have an elevated BMI um, to consider using a dose cap to try to avoid um, excess toxicity. Um, I do want to take a, a brief digression into talking a little bit about asparaginase levels, which will be helpful as we go through our cases. The, the, as uh, Dr. Winter uh, explained, asparagine depletion is really how asparaginase works, and probably uh, ideally the best way to measure the efficacy of our therapy. That being said, asparagine depletion is very challenging to measure in, in, in vivo due to ex vivo depletion. And so we've generally used serum asparaginase activity as a surrogate marker of, um, of the efficacy of our drugs. Um, the exact therapeutic level um, of asparagine, asparaginase activity that is needed is, has been the subject of a lot of different papers, and there isn't a clear answer for that. Um, the levels greater than 0.1 are generally considered efficacious. The FDA has used greater than 0.4 in some of their studies, but... Um, there's still a lot of room to try to sort out what actually is needed. Um, serum, asparag serum asparaginase levels do go down over time, and so you can see in this uh, graph that uh, many patients have levels above those cutoffs for at least 20 days or so. Um, this second chart looks at, um, in, in, uh, in yellow, looks at uh, pegaspargase and Calpegasparis in uh, blue at the uh, dosing, and you can see that many patients remain therapeutic above those uh, 0.4 and 0.1 for upwards of 25 days. But I, uh, just as an important point is that um, if the serum asparaginase activity level drops more than one would expect, it, it can sort of suggest that you're uh, looking at a situation of silent in inactivation. inactivation. Yes. Um, one of the things we tried to do, um, and this is a trial that we uh, worked on looking at patients who received pegasparagase and who had asparagine levels at the same time as asparaginase levels. Um, I mentioned some challenges with ex vivo depletion. Um, we worked pretty hard in this trial to try to minimize that as well as checked CSF asparagine, asparagine levels where um, the ex vivo depletion is not, as, not a concern as asparagine, asparaginase itself does not cross the blood-brain barrier. And what we found is that in patients who had a serum asparaginase level as low as 0.02, all of those patients had asparagine depletion. Asparagine depletion and, were, and it had it undetected, whereas in the few patients that had a level less than 0.02, but even though it was measurable, did have asparagine detected. And that, I think, calls into question whether you absolutely need to be 0.1 at, to be therapeutic. That being said, I think that still is the number that's generally considered acceptable. 
Um, a few interesting patients we did see as part of this trial. Um, these are the two patients that did have detectable asparaginase but still had asparagine repletion. And we can see uh, when this patient had a level of 0.36, they still were depleted for asparagine, which is in the, in the dark blue. Uh, and then as the level got down to 0.014, that the asparag asparagine became um, back to the baseline level. And the same is seen with the second patient. Um, that being said, we also had some patients with very low levels, somewhere between 0 0.08 and 0 0.3, all of which are below that 0 0.4 value that the, the FDA has looked to for um, approvals of asparaginase products, and each of them had no aspar asparagine, even with those lower levels. Um, getting back to Michael, um, Michael received a cap dose of peg asparaginase on day four of induction. Um, one week later, an asparag asparaginase activity level was obtained and was 0 0.607. Um, and I will say from clinical practice, that's fairly common. I think most patients that uh, we check a level about a week after asparaginase are somewhere in the order of uh, 0.6 to 1, um, which is certainly super therapeutic. On day 20 of induction, that patient develops a persistent headache and nausea. MRI shows a, um, a sagittal sinus thrombosis. I think it uh, brings up a couple of questions uh, about how one should, would manage the thrombosis, both, both acutely and in the long term, and then uh, what to do about future doses of pegasparagines that this patient uh, would, would be due for. Stuart, you know, what you guys, your experience in practice would be? Yeah, so um, at, at my institution, which is uh, Children's Minnesota, we would uh, attempt to try to reverse this uh, clot with uh, TPA and then start um, a low molecular weight heparin. And uh, in our experience, that usually works pretty well. Um, at, at my institution, we have generally then restart, we have intermittently used low molecular weight heparin during uh, subsequent courses of asparaginase just to prevent uh, the clot from recurring. That's usually followed after about six months, uh, you know, three to six months of just giving the low molecular weight heparin. But um, as this audience knows, you have to kind of work around spinal taps with low molecular weight heparin. And so uh, we, we try to kind of use it uh, sparingly when we think it's uh, safe. Uh, how about you, Dr. Shore? Yeah. How about at your place? So I'm um, uh, at Children's National. We similarly would uh, consider t uh, directed thrombolytic therapy and then start a patient on low molecular weight heparin. Um, for a um, sinus thrombosis like this, we would typically consider that, uh, continue that for at least six months and would also uh, cover the patient at least prophylactically, uh, if not ther for therapeutically, during times of future pegasparaginase doses, uh, both both starting with the dose and, and for a couple of weeks thereafter. Um, and as, as you pointed out, we have to we do struggle with keeping the platelets up and patients needing more platelet transfusions during that right. time. Um, but um, you know, as we discussed pre showed earlier from Gupta's paper, uh, omitting pegasparaginase in these patients is associated with a worse prognosis. So we try our best to get in, get in all the doses. Uh, that we can get in safely. Yep. Can I just comment one? Uh, please. During, I think the biggest challenge we are facing in scenario like this is maintaining the platelet counts, especially during consolidation and delayed intensification, where, it, I mean, it's hard to maintain platelets above 50,000 because the new protocols are so intensive. And I've seen a lot of discontinuation of low molecular weight heparin yeah. at that time. So looking at the risk, Looking at the risk versus benefit, I don't know how feasible that is to continue low molecular weight heparin, especially if you have a stroke. And then the risk increases when you're not able to continue it because the half-life is only 24 hours. Yeah, and so as, as start with that, I think I think you, you definitely definitely are challenges in terms of maintaining the platelet th platelet account, particularly in those more intense parts of chemotherapy. I think during the first three to six months after thrombosis, we try very hard. We sometimes have patients coming two to three times a week if needed to get keep their platelets up. I think that does cause us to think about whether uh, after the clot has resolved and in just the prophylactic setting, if we should. Uh, consider using Lovenox at a, at a prophylactic dosing instead of a treatment dosing. And in that setting, our hematologists are, have been comfortable with keeping the platelets over 30, which is a little more manageable. Uh, and to your point, um, sometimes uh, uh, trying to keep platelet counts above 50,000 does sort of interact with like when you start the next phase of therapy. <clears throat> and so I've seen some institutions try to 
if they can build in another week of recovery just on a case by case basis but it, it is a it is a challenging situation yeah, and um, just a, another little summary slide of some of the, the range of asparagus associated with toxicities. And, you know, some of these toxicities do affect our ability to continue asparaginase therapy and, and do um, delay therapy overall. Um, I think, you know, one of the things, we're going to talk about some of these as the case continues, but one of the things I do want to highlight specifically is hepatotoxicity and hypervaluminemia. Um, this is a particular finding that, um, you know, speaking to adult oncologists, they're quite uh, nervous about and, and often is a reason that asparaginase is not even given to older patients. Um, but I think uh, particularly in our obese patients, um, Hispanic patients, um, this ca um, can be a significant problem and can delay uh, other systemic therapy. Uh, the, the, there has been some anecdotal evidence and some retrospective evidence that levocarnitine can be useful in uh, either preventing or reversing this, this hepatotoxicity. And the Children's Oncology Group, uh, in cooperation with some of the adult groups, uh, is working on a prospective trial that hopefully will be opening uh, soon, looking at levocarnitine both for prophylaxis and treatment of the hepatotoxicity. I, I, I did have a question for the audience and for those online, and I'm just curious if anyone has patients where they feel like the asparaginase is making them either cachectic or lose too much weight. Uh, I've seen a couple cases of that in my career, at least I think I have. I'm just wondering if other people have seen anything like that. Yeah. Actually, There's, um, forty percent of his weight almost during induction, and uh -huh. there wasn't anything. I mean, you're expecting him to gain some weight for the steroid or something like that. <clears throat> he didn't have severe hyperglycemia to explain that. Right. We were giving him NG tube feeds, so it was really hard um, to get him back on track. Yeah, and I've had a couple uh, kids like that too. And and to Dr. Shore's point, uh, you know, we'll talk later about what can we do to kind of control some of those symptoms with levocarnitine or acetylcarnitines, but yeah, I think I think it, it does come up. Anyway, uh, back to you, uh, Dr. Short. Sorry, how would, you, how would you say it's asparaginase because there are multiple agents which are there. It's very difficult mm -hmm. to judge because doxorubicin, doxorubicin can do that. I mean, donorubicin, your cytoxin, RSC, I mean, all those can cause right. bad nausea, vomiting, you can lose weight. Right. So how will you pinpoint with asparaginase because it's never used as a single agent. Yeah, good, good question. And in my experience, what, what I, where I got that impression from is the patients were saying, I was doing okay, I was eating okay, and then I got that dose of that drug, and man, I just couldn't look at food for a, uh, for a while. And, and so it was like that, that direct kind of interrogation of what happened after a dose. Um. Getting back to a little bit of uh, some some uh, some some of the management of thrombosis after asparaginase, the incidence is uh, between three and five percent in children, and most of these are occurring in induction, although they can occur at later time points. Um, and the the uh, well, the risk does appear to be similar regardless of asparaginase products used. Um, generally, I think the most most important message is manage that manage the clot as you would manage a non asparaginase related clot. And then in general, in most cases, after clot stabilization, um, with continued anticoagulation, you are able to resume asparaginase dosing. Um, you should have some questions on your iPad and virtually that you can answer at this point. And I'll turn it back over to Dr. Winter. Um, you know, there is one that uh, popped up on my iPad here, and it's about, and the question is, what about the subset of patients that are not able to get uh, due to TPA and weight is one question that uh, uh, comes up. And then earlier in the presentation, there was a, a question about how do you dose asparaginase in patients with borderline high BMA, BMI? Um, uh, do you want to take either one of those uh, questions, Dr. Shore? Yeah. I think that the, the borderline high BMI, I think, I, I think you know, for the patients that are high BMI, I do think that thinking about dose capping is 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 very reasonable. As I mentioned, most patients with um, that we check levels uh, seven to ten days after are usually in the 0.6 to one range, which is probably super therapeutic. And so I think um, it's very reasonable to think about dose capping for patients 
that, uh, that are at, the, at that higher range. And then I'll just briefly say that in patients where I haven't been able to give TPA, we've tried to just use uh, low molecular heparin with lots of follow-up, but, but again, we do try to use TPA uh, when we can. Okay, I'm gonna uh, take it over here and continue on with our uh, discussion uh, with Michael. And so here he is again. Uh, Michael receives day 15 consolidation pegaspiragase by IV infusion. And then he develops nausea and mild flushing 10 minutes into the infusion. And so uh, Dr. Shore, if you get this page in clinic, what are you thinking when you're going into that room? Yeah. I think when you, when you, 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 the, the symptoms of, um, of hypersensitivity reactions have to be differentiated from the symptoms of infusional reactions mm -hmm. are often caused by hyperammonemia. And I think that can be very, uh, very, very tricky at times. But I think when I hear nausea and flushing, but I don't hear rash, I don't hear uh, breathing difficulties, I, I think more of hyperammonemia and uh, try to do a physical exam to assess, assess that and before deciding what to do about that. Yeah, it's probably one of my least favorite pages. To, to yeah, at, at about 4 o'clock Friday afternoon. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, that's when it happens, too, yeah. All right, so, um, <clears throat> so uh, as Dr. Shore just said, based on lack of what sounds like classic uh, hypersensitivity, uh, we would want to think of this first as an infusion reaction. <clears throat> and so uh, that, in, in my clinic anyway, results in a pause in the infusion, monitor for improvement, restart the infusion at a slower rate, and try to calm everybody down, because that's usually what, what that, that situation looks like. All right, so during the next section of the presentation, I'm gonna, we're gonna kind of toggle back and forth between hypersensitivity and infusion reactions, because they can be kind of hard to differentiate from each other. So as this audience knows, asparaginase, it's an enzyme, it's a foreign protein, <clears throat> and, be, and because of that, it can provoke an immune response. In many cases, hypersensitivity is, uh, uh, is manifested by anaphylaxis or allergy. And so what that looks like in the clinic is swollen lips, urticaria, sudden difficulty breathing, uh, you know, things that, that look like that. Um, hypersensitivity reactions are associated with immune destruction. And, but mostly what they do is they make it so that the asparaginase doesn't work anymore. And as you all recall from the slide that I presented from Gupta et al., we wanna make sure that people do see the asparaginase dose intensity that we're looking for on our, our studies. So um, there are two sort of alternatives. Uh, well, there are, there are two uh, basically uh, types of asparaginase that we've been working with that generally kind of tee up the problem for hypersensitivity, and that's uh, native asparaginase. Uh, it was very highly associated with hypersensitivity reactions, up to 60%. Native asparaginase is not available in uh, the United States right now, but I, it's still being used in parts of, of Europe. As, as it shows here in the second bullet item, uh, if you give it with corticosteroids, which dampen down the immune system, you see less, less of those problems. Because of all the problems with native asparaginase, uh, asparaginase was pegylated to make it less immunogenic, and so it, it works that way. Uh, but the incidence of uh, asparaginase hypersensitivity reactions have ranged um, quite a bit, anywhere from three to 36%. So uh, a lot of variation in that. Um, so this is a paper that uh, I was on with a number of authors that I thought uh, was really a nice, um, uh, way to look at uh, hypersensitivity reactions. And so, as you can see from the data there, we looked at you know, 54,000 doses of PEG given on a number of COG studies for both B cell and T cell disease. And as you can see um, uh, from the uh, bar graph there, most of the um, hypersensitivity reactions happened uh, with the second or third dose, which is usually consolidation. So that's where that all happened generally. Uh, the committee kind of thought, you know, true hypersensitivity reactions are pretty rare during induction, and that's often when uh, kids are getting steroids and seeing those uh, drugs for the first time. But yeah, it was consolidation where most of that happened. So interestingly, 
the IV prep of a pegasparaginase was associated with less true hypersensitivity reactions, which I have to say at the time shocked us because we thought that you know, the IM would be a little safer. And in fact, during my fellowship, I was trained that if you give PEG IV, you know, you're going to see immediate hypersensitivity reaction that you can't control. And so there was a lot of drama around making that switch and a lot of discussion at meetings. And uh, But I'm glad that we persisted with asking the question because uh, you can see the answer was not what we thought it would be. And it's a highly significant uh, uh, finding with all of that. Uh, and I think one of the things that is interesting, and I think as you're probably about to get to, about infusion reactions, I think a lot of those first dose reactions probably were infusion reactions yeah. that weren't really detected. I know you right. mentioned the paper that pointed 36%. Right. Uh, I knew that on the, the COG trial that first gave things IV, we had quite a few right. reports of first dose reactions, and they just didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, the, the one thing that is interesting is that uh, the PEG part of PEG asparaginase is in a lot of cosmetics uh, yeah. and large numbers of, uh, of American and European populations do have PEG allergies. Yeah. So a small percentage of them might be, PEG, might be PEG related allergies, although uh, I think a lot, probably the vast majority of them are actually infusional reactions. Right. And to add to your comments, uh, Dr. Shore, um, when we first started doing this and we were telling families we're going to give this PEG asparaginase IV rather than IM. I think a lot of families were like, oh, I'm not really sure I want to do this. And, and so I feel like, you know, in some cases, people were just really hypersensitized, at least emotionally, to kind of uh, and a change in how we did things. So infusion reactions, like I said, we're going to toggle back and forth between these two topics. Uh, they developed during or shortly after the IV infusion. It's a release of cytokines or histamine, uh, activation of a complement. But, um, but I think mostly it's just a sharp elevation of ammonia levels. And as I said at the beginning of this talk, asparaginase deaminates things. Uh, asparagine and glutamine, and that uh, NH2 group uh, comes off, floats around in the bloodstream, it picks up a couple proteins and it turns into ammonia. And, and ammonia makes people feel bad. And so I, I think that's a little bit of some of those infusional things and, um, and, you know, actually part of like why sometimes people just don't feel well after, uh, after getting some of these drugs. So hypersensitivity versus infusion, uh, timing, antibody reactions, uh, most likely second, third doses, as we just said, um, infusional reactions with first exposure. But there is a lot of overlap. And one of the ways you can try to differentiate some of these uh, phenomena from each other are serum asparaginase activity levels. And so I, I have a, an algorithm that will do that in uh, just a couple minutes here. So I, I won't read every word on this slide, but uh, you know some of the things that can be looked at in a clinic setting when you're asked to you know, evaluate a situation is that infusion reactions tend to um, more commonly include things like headache, flushing, diffuse erythema, but not diffuse urticaria, rigors, and uh, in some cases, you know, kids just saying that they have uh, trouble breathing. And as I read through that slide, I was uh, highlighting on all the things that are in red there. If you look at hypersensitivity, you know, there's in the dermatological category, it's pruritus, urticaria, um, you know, things that kind of go along more with uh, what you'd expect to see with uh, um, uh, an allergic reaction. So uh, this too is a bit of a complicated slide, but I think it's an important slide. And as I said earlier in the talk that you, you can download this information. I think this is a nice algorithm that would allow someone to distinguish a hypersensitivity reaction from an infusion reaction. And it does it based on uh, the evaluation of serum asparaginase uh, activity levels. And I believe that there was um, uh, one of the questions in the chat already about how do you do that. And so I, I hope I might have just addressed that right now by saying that just measuring these levels can be helpful in kind of uh, deciding you know, what your next step is gonna look like. So anyway, it's really, I think it's a really helpful slide. So pre-medication, and there, again, there's a couple questions in the chat about, you know, do you pre-medicate or not? And so that's become kind of a, a, a current topic over the last five, 10 years. Um, the, um, they are used to prevent infusion reactions. 
like I said before, uh, with uh, histamine release, that kind of thing. And so what, what people tend to use for pre-medications are things like famotidine, methylprednisone, Benadryl, and Tylenol. Uh, interestingly, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, differences in how people use those different drugs to kind of uh, protect against some of these uh, phenomena from happening. Um, and you can see from the bar graph on the right, uh, premedication tends to improve the to tolerance of pegaspargase, and that was reported by Cooper et al. Uh, in 2019. So like I just said, practices vary. Um, I'm curious, uh, Dr. Shore, what, what's your practices at your institution for pre-meds? Yeah, so at Children's National, we do pre-medicate all patients receiving uh, asparaginase products with diphenylhydramine and famotidine. Um, for patients that are getting steroids as part of their chemotherapy, we do not give additional steroids, but for patients that are in a phase that doesn't include steroids, we do give hydrocortisone. The hydrocortisone was a, a more recent uh, addition, and we're, we're in the process of analyzing the data. I'm not completely convinced that the, hydro the, the hydrocortisone did change things, although I do think that the pre-medication overall changed things. And then we, we do routinely check uh, therapeutic drug monitoring with uh, asparaginase levels between 7 and 10 days after each dose of uh, asparagine. Yeah, and, and I would say that what I've seen in my career is that for a while we were trying not to premedicate patients because you didn't want to cover up a reaction and not know that you had some kind of a um, silent inactivation process happening. But then the, the use of um, therapeutic monitoring became more widespread and it was able, we were able to kind of tell which one was which. And so I think that's been a really nice advance uh, over the last few years. Yeah. So add one thing just to, to mention, I think, I think that, that, that advent of the ability to send asparagus levels and get results very quickly has right. helped a lot. Yep. Um, and we, we, do, we do check things, about, as I say, seven to 10 days after the long-acting asparaginases, and we typically check after, uh, before the second dose for patients that are getting uh, a short-acting product. All right, so let's go back to Michael. Michael is now at day 22 of consolidation. As you may recall, he's our 16-year-old uh, African-American male with TALL, he's in consolidation, and he complains of abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, um, an astute uh, person uh, checks his amylase and lipase levels and finds that they're three times higher than the upper limit of normal, and the ultrasound shows that he has acute uh, pancreatitis. Um, so recommendations for this are to admit to the hospital, bowel rest, IV hydration, um, and follow these patients really uh, carefully. I guess the question comes up is, uh, you know, do you want to rechallenge after something like this? So um, here is a, a, a paper from Wolders et al. from uh, 2017, and it basically just looks at uh, what's, what's the incidence, and it's 5 to 10% of patients. And certainly in my lived experience, the severity varies quite w widely uh, when it occurs. Um, but as you can see here, as you look across the bottom of this uh, uh, graph, you can see a death due to asparaginase-associated pancreatitis. And there are some dots in the yes column. And in my career, I've had a couple patients that really, really got sick with pancreatitis, spent a month or two in the hospital on TPN. And it's it's a big challenge. It's really, really tough when it happens and when it happens really badly. Um, there are some cases, though, where it seems to be a, sort of a minor event. And so just to kind of talk about rechallenge after your pancreatitis, the incidence of recurrence after rechallenge is um, it's pretty high. It's about 50%. And uh, there are, I guess there are ways to make this decision using CTCAE uh, criteria to kind of distinguish how bad is it. Um, the second episode might not be as severe, but I think, you know, Dr. Shore and I really talked carefully about this slide before presenting it. We really think that you should re uh, assess risk versus benefits of rechallenge with your team, hopefully to include, you know, a clinical pharmacologist or other people that can really help, you know, try to keep your patient out of trouble. Uh, do you want to add anything to what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I, I think this, this uh, you know, in general, we spoke a lot about the importance of asparagine. I think pancreatitis is one of the side effects that has a lot of us pretty scared given the incidence of recurrence. I think, right. uh, you know, one of the things that comes up sometimes is some 
belly pain, with imaging that's not suggestive of pancreatitis, but with the elevated amylase and lipase, uh, you know, and the patient may, may or may not have concomitant uh, constipation or some other cause of abdominal mm -hmm. pain. And I think in some of those patients we have rechallenged locally and, and been successful. I think in the patients that have had, um, you know, significant uh, hemorrhagic pancreatitis, pseudocysts, and real problems, uh, we have been very cautious and generally have not. So uh, moving on with Michael, uh, he receives pegaspargase on day 43, and he develops highs and shortness of breath 30, shortness of breath 30 seconds later, and how would you manage? And so, well, uh, we think that you have to make a decision here, because uh, we think that this patient has a hypersensitivity reaction that's pretty obvious, and you can't keep giving pegaspargase to a patient who just did that, because you know it's not gonna turn out very well. So you are at a decision point, and so with your teams, we would want you to consider the pros and cons of switching to either Irwinia or to a desensitization protocol. <clears throat> um, talking about these two different forms, there's no cross-reactivity between E. coli and Irwinia. Um, uh, the switch to Irwinia asparaginase for the remainder of asparaginase courses uh, uh, can uh, lead to definitive allergic reaction. It can also have inactivation issues. And uh, TDM is uh, helpful for managing that. Um, so uh, <clears throat> the uh, current conversion, <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, for every 2,500 units of, of pegasperginase replaced with six doses of Irwinia at 25,000 uh, units per meter squared. So the big question then becomes, what if Irwinia is not available? And that was really very much a big question over the last couple of years. So um, because of some uh, pipeline issues, because of some supply chain issues, um, uh, the question of desensitization really came to the forefront of our science. A number of papers came out on how to desensitize patients with PEG asparaginase uh, allergic reactions because as we discussed earlier, not uh, maintaining asparaginase uh, intensity really does lead to uh, inferior outcomes. And so it forced our hand as a community to come up with some way uh, of kind of managing this. And that's what all these papers are saying here. And so um, let's say that Michael tolerated desensitization with premedication, had to replace the uh, day 43 dose of a peg asparagus. And then we looked uh, seven days later and it's 0 0.01. So obviously desensitization uh, did not uh, seem to work very well in his case. How would you manage it? Uh, Dr. Shore, you wanna yeah. comment on uh, what you're thinking here? Yeah, so I think, you know, uh, this, uh, you know, apparently desensitization worked because you didn't have clinical symptoms, but I think in the setting of a level one week later that's, uh, well below the level of right. therapeutic benefit, I think that patient didn't really get benefit from that, and I think it's time to switch to an alternative uh, Irwinia product. So uh, silent inactivation, uh, no clinical manifestations, but you do see a uh, loss of uh, serum uh, asparaginic activity levels. And so here's kind of like the guidelines for what to look for, and as you can see at 14 days, if it's less than 0.1, um, you probably need to, to find something else. So we're going to talk a little bit about recombinant asparaginase here, and recombinant cristantopase uh, is produced in Pseudomonas, and uh, we're just going to call it recombinant uh, asparaginase from here forward. The primary amino acid sequence is uh, very comparable to the Arwinia, and it is now currently approved as a component of multi-agent therapy for the treatment of leukemia in both children and adults who have developed um, hypersensitivities to uh, PEG asparaginase. So in this particular study, uh, uh, SAA was used to monitor effect, and you can see on the left, there's Irwinia at 25,000 units per meter squared, and then there's recombinant or Irwinia to the right, and they had very comparable um, decay curves in that particular experiment. And uh, currently, recombinant asparaginase um, has been through a number of dosing uh, evaluations, both IM and IV. And currently, um, if you look at how many uh, patients had levels greater than 0 0.1 with 25 milligrams per meter squared IM, 
uh, all patients did. And so it looks like it's, it's a, a drug that can replace um, Irwinia because you can't, you can't uh, get the Irwinia. Um, as Dr. Shore uh, mentioned earlier in our talk, if you're looking at levels of greater than 0 0.4, um, that was not preserved with uh, this particular drug. But again, there's a lot of um, uh, you know, discussion about what, what is the right level to pick. So uh, this is a phase two, three study. Uh, and I, uh, it's uh, uh, now in a point where it's being evaluated for both IM and IV. And uh, based on PK and safety data, the recommended starting dose is 25 mg per meter squared IM and 37.5 milligrams per meter squared IV on Monday, Wednesday, Friday is uh, what is being evaluated and um, looked at very carefully right now. So um, uh, the dosing is showing that uh, the efficacy is maintained in these uh, uh, phase two and three studies. And so uh, uh, an IM dose of 25 milligrams per meter squared on Monday and Wednesday and 50 milligrams on Friday appears to uh, demonstrate a good uh, benefit to risk profile. And it appears to maintain a good serum asparaginase activity levels at both 48 and 72 hours uh, based on the data that uh, was pre presented at ASH uh, last year. I will say one thing. Um, at my institution, we're using the IM dose of 25 milligrams per meter squared Monday, Wednesday, and 50 milligrams per meter squared on Friday. I have had a couple of patients say that the Friday dose is tough, that they really have a tough weekend because of just not feeling well. And so we're now looking into a couple of options of trying to provide levocarnitine or acetylcarnitine to help uh, ameliorate some of those symptoms. And so I think that's the focus of an upcoming uh, uh, COG study is to look at how do we make the patient journey a little you know, more pleasant. Um, and I, I wonder if uh, other people are having that experience. Are, are you seeing anything like that at uh, your place? Yeah, so I, I will say the, you know, the FDA approved dosing was 25 every other day. And we actually, uh, for patients that are not on tr protocol or, or that, that were not on this initial uh, recombinant or renia protocol using that 25 milligram dose every other day, um, which is logistically challenging because we have patients having to come in on the weekends mm -hmm. uh, to complete their six doses. We did have a number of patients on the 25, 25, 50 dose uh, as part of the COG protocol. And I, I do think that a lot of those patients had problems with that Friday dose. Um, yeah. And um, I think you know, mentioned earlier about weight loss and, and poor weight gain. And I, and I think a lot of times patients that were getting that regimen, particularly when they're not on steroids, or even when they are on steroids, and you'd be thinking they'd be eating just, the, they're not. just, just not, yeah. and, and particularly over the weekend, which I think also, you know, alluded to one of the questions asked earlier, how do we know it's asparaginase? I think that that sort of timing right. makes you, makes you um, suspicious of that. Exactly. And so I have a patient at Children's Minnesota who was getting this, this particular regimen, and I passed him in the hall the other day, and I said, so, hey, how did your Friday uh, dose go? And he said, it went great. And I said, oh, that's really good. That must mean that the levocarnitine is really working. And he said, no, I refused to get the 50 milligram per meter squared dose. <laughs> I got the 25. And so I'm like, okay. And, and so, you know, for patients that are young adults who can say no to things. Um, you know, I think we just have to keep in mind that, you know, we really do have to partner with them to keep them, uh, you, know, uh, you, you know, getting dr drug doses that we think are acceptable and will help them. But, you know, we, we really do have to be mindful that these conversations are happening in the hallway and, and yeah, and they totally matter because uh, patients can say no and we, we don't want that to happen. So I'm going to just present um, a couple more slides here kind of quickly, but I just thought this was kind of cool stuff, kind of state of the art, and I just wanted to put this out there, is that recently people have become interested in using genomics to predict who might have PEG hypersensitivity uh, or any kind of asparaginase hypersensitivity reactions. And so as this audience know, the H human leukocyte antigens are really important important part of our genome that helped to determine self versus non-self. And it turns out that uh, DQB1, DQA1 are really involved with mediating asparaginase anaphylaxis. And this is from a paper by Dishpande et al. from uh, 2021. 
and so this led to uh, further work uh, uh, with this group of investigators uh, to look at uh, what was the effect of uh, Pegasperogase hypersensitivity in a lot, large population of uh, patients. Um, we looked at uh, almost 5,000 different um, uh, patients, and uh, some from St. Jude, some from COG, BNT together. And what we found was that um, if patients were HLA, DRB1, DQA1, or DQB1 negative, they had um, a rate of hypersensitivity of about 11% or so. If they were triple positive, though, for DRB1, DQA1, and DQB1, you can see the right-hand bar there shows that they were twice as likely to have a hypersensitivity reaction. And if you look at the p-value, it was 2 times 10 to the minus 7th power. Uh, this uh, study was done largely in, in children and young adults of European ancestry. And it just got me to thinking, well, what about what is it like in other ancestral groups? And I think that's the basis of uh, a really important future study to look at. Is this the same for everybody or not? And so I, I kind of feel like this is kind of a, a future direction we should look into. Um, Dr. Shore, I'm going to uh, kick it back over to you. And so just I sort of wanted to give a little summary on some take-home points. You know, asparaginase is a critical component of um, ALL and lymphoblastic lymphoma therapy. There's a unique toxicity profile that that can be challenging at times to, to manage and figure out the, the, the different potential causes, the different potential events that might be occurring. Hypersensitivity is a common reason for pegasparaginase discontinuation, and it's very important to try to replace asparaginase that has to be discontinued with alternative therapy because we know that that strongly affects outcomes, particularly in high-risk patients. And you know we need alternative asparaginase availability that certainly has improved greatly with recombinant asparaginase. I know speaking to patients over the years when we needed, wanted to replace patients with winning and didn't have it was a, a very great challenge for both clinicians and patients, so it's good to have that availability. All right, um, I think we have about five minutes left for uh, just uh, questions. So let me uh, jump to the first question that was posed about an hour ago. And the question is, what do we recommend for do establishing, determining the severity of hypersensitivity? Question, is it CTCAE or are there other tools? In, in my experience uh, as a study chair, it's really using the CTCAE uh, tools to do that. And as a matter of fact, at Children's Minnesota, we're using that particular tool to help differentiate between low-grade versus high-grade hypersensitivity reactions, low-grade maybe being a portion to desensitization, and high-grade maybe uh, just going over to recombinant um, uh, 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 Irwinia. Um, the trick will be, of course, is getting everybody to follow those, those guidelines, but, but that's our, our intent. Um, so, uh, Dr. Shore, you want to take the next one. Which asparaginase toxicities are more prominent or troublesome in children versus adults? Any, any thoughts yeah. on that one? So, yeah, so I think most of them are probably more, I think that most, prob most asparaginase toxicities are probably greater troublesome in adults, and I'll also acknowledge that not really treating too many adults, but just in speaking to our adult oncologists. Um, I think that uh, our older teenagers also have some of those adult-related problems. Um, particularly uh, risks of hepatotoxicity, I think, are, are very significant in those older populations, um, those, those obese patients. Um, and I think, you know, speaking to adult oncologists, um, you know, besides their routine dose capping, I think over a certain age, depending on the oncologist, somewhere between 30 and 50, they just won't give asparaginase at all and will rely on non-asparaginase-based uh, protocols. Well, very good. Um, next question, I'll take this one. Premedicate or not? to premedicate to prevent allergic reactions. Um, as I think I said before, we, we, we do that at Children's Minnesota. Um, there is also a COG website that pharmacists can kind of put in their practices. I looked at that website data a few days ago and it felt to me that of people that self-reported, around 80% of people were premedicating, but there were some sites that don't. Again, you know, practices vary. I will say that uh, at my place, we, we pre-medicate. Pre um, so Dr. Shore, how about the next one for you? How do you approach lower grade AE, such as subclinical or laboratory pancreatitis, yeah. if you want to take a Yeah, start? I think sub the subclinical or the laboratory pancreatitis is probably the one area where we often will re-challenge. Um, 
I think uh, wait for those to resolve, and assuming those resolve in some reasonable time frame, typically will rechallenge. I think the the clinical ones are a lot more concerning for me than the the subclinical. Very good. Next question in queue. Uh, could you discuss the risk of a tall, thin adolescent with a BMI greater than the 95th percentile? Is that person's risk the same? Um, so, you know, my sense of, of BMI is that when you dose on BMI, um, you're not just dosing the person's serum and CSF with asparaginase, you're dosing their liver and a lot of other things, and, uh, and you know, livers are not necessarily keeping up to speed with a person's overall BMI. So um, I kind of feel like, at least in my, this is my opinion, I feel like uh, you know, going off the BMI probably is something that can help with organ sparing. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, and I think that the, the tall patient who doesn't have an elevated BMI but has an elevated, um, Oh, sorry, sorry. The, the patient that has an LVMI, I do think that there's reason to be concerned. I also think the fact that we have a lot of evidence that most patients at that higher range are getting very high levels from lower doses, I think it's an area where you can definitely consider dose capping and consider following levels just to make sure you're still getting the efficacy that you want. Great. Uh, next question is, we pre-medicate every patient getting asparaginase. Can you comment on that? And I would say, yes, we do the same. We do the same at, at my place as well. Um, Dr. Shorten, over to you. Would you adapt or identify, intensify pre-medication protocols ahead of consolidation? Yeah. So you would like uh, personalize it for the patient. Yeah, I think so. The, the only difference that we do is in consolidation, we do give hydrocortisone, and we don't do that in induction when patients are already on steroid. I don't really think there's other ways to really tailor that. Yeah. Excellent. Um, Next question, I'll, I'll take a shot at it. I've heard that drawing a tryptase level can be helpful in distinguishing hypersensitivity versus infusion as well. Is that true? And I, and I have to say, I don't know the answer to that. I don't. I yeah, don't. I, I have not used tryptase levels. I think ammonia levels can be helpful. And I, you know, often if, uh, you know, one of the things that we try to do to try to help distinguish this is we actually have one of the leukemia providers by the bedside whenever we start a, new, a patient on asparaginase, just so if there is a reaction, which usually happens pretty quick, someone's around uh, sort of that's better trained to assess that. And if we have a reaction that we're not sure about, we will um, draw an ammonia level immediately uh, after shutting off the infusion. And sometimes that can help us because a very high ammonia level can give us an answer, but I've not used tryptase levels. So, I, you know, I think we're at time, and uh, I want to be respectful of the time for people in the audience and online. Um, I, I, I wanted to say I really, really enjoyed being here today. I, I love the discussion we had with the audience and people online. And again, I just really want to thank the organizers for inviting uh, Dr. Shore and I to present today. Uh, Dr. Shore, do you have any concluding yeah, no. comments? Yeah, and I wanted to, to also s s similarly thank everyone for being here and thank Purview and, and Jazz for, for arranging this. Uh, I hope that uh, everyone got something out of this and certainly encourage people to continue the conversation. And have a great meeting. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash KQX860. This program is supported by an independent medical education grant from Jazz Pharmaceuticals.